So 20 years ago, exactly, exactly, two very important things were born. One is Fortune Most Powerful Women, and the other is Google. <laughs> September 2000 and um, September 1998, uh, same, same month, same year. Um, Ruth at the time, in 1998, was global head of tech equity capital markets at Morgan Stanley. So Ruth, in 1998, what were you thinking was hot in the, in the tech industry? I saw all of this coming. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, you know, it was exciting. I took over as head of tech equity capital markets in 1996. So Morgan Stanley had just completed the Netscape IPO. And we were on the verge of this very exciting period where people were really trying to figure out what was the next cool thing. It was about really the birth of the internet and one IPO after another, companies that have become household names. And so it was an exciting time, but we were figuring it out. It was really early days. When you think about where we were then versus today and just the sheer scale and speed and utility of the internet. It was like nothing that we'd seen, and we were trying to figure out where it would go, what was really differentiated. Was Google on your radar in 1998? So I had the opportunity to invest in Google in 1998 through, it was pretty amazing. Um, as Larry Page noted when I told him, he said, well, then you didn't get very many shares, and he was <laughs> completely right. I got a little bit through an angel fund, and at the time, I think, like, Many, I was trying to figure out, was there really a place for another search engine and kind of what was this going to be? And then over time, Morgan Stanley was working with Google and really seeing the um, extraordinary approach, the technology, the simplicity, the elegance, the passion. We started to see that this mission that sounded so audacious to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful was really the beginning of something big. So in 2004, by this time, Ruth was vice chairman of global investment banking when Morgan Stanley led the Google IPO. And Ruth, what did you, what did you see then in 2004 that has developed that you didn't see coming, that you missed? Well, I would say I've, I've sort of addressed it. I think there are two things. Um, you know, back in 2000, there were about 400 million people online. Today, we're approaching 4 billion. You think about the sheer speed um, and therefore just the convenience of being online. You think of the compute capacity, what we used to have on a desktop and what we now have in the palm of our hand. You think of the utility of apps, the ability between meetings or in a cab ride to get content, you know, transact, all of that is just opening up this incredible world. I remember back in that 1998 period, one of the key questions was the internet can just be a new form of distribution or it can enable something truly transformative. And I think the first question was, how is the technology or whatever your business is truly transformative? How are you providing a service and a utility or solving problems in ways that have not been done before? And that was one of the things that was sort of the first eye-opener, the way that you could actually either just use this as a distribution channel or provide a way that you create extraordinary new experiences for users around the globe. And trans transform your company potentially and uh, create new businesses that are transformative for various industries. Exactly. And I, you know, when I look at what's going on today with AI, there's a part of AI, there's the scary narrative, there's also the opportunity for each of us in every industry, I think, to embrace the potential for artificial intelligence to create new ways to have a closer relationship with your customers, to improve efficiency in your business. And I'm of the view that you're gonna be able over time to distinguish winners and losers in industries based on the extent to which they actually figure out how to apply machine learning to their businesses. 
So in 2004, when Larry and Sergey were talking about, you know, we want to do a different kind of IPO, which Google did, and we have this don't be evil philosophy, and was there any anticipation at that time that someday, when Google is really big and really successful, that there may be issues around data privacy and <laughs> bias, political bias in search? <laughs> was that, I mean, at what, at what point, so, at what point did you, as a, as a banker, and I realize that your work as a banker went way beyond the technology industry then, but at what point did you start kind of paying attention to that? So I think that, again, one of the really important lessons for all industries that I took away from the work during, um, during the financial crisis, and again, I think it applies to all industries in good times and in bad, is really the need to think about what are sort of unintended consequences of everything we're doing. There may be potential extraordinary upside, but what are the unintended consequences? And how do we each stay ahead of those um, in any industry that we're in? And you know, if I think about your question, some of the ones around privacy, privacy has been very important for Google since inception. Google was the first to say, you can take your data with you. We have security and privacy controls that you can control your account, your activities. So at the earliest days, Google was clearly focused on um, privacy and data, and the data is yours. The company was built, you know, very much it's about user, the user experience, respect the user is a key mantra internally. And so that means the user, it's, it's your data, it's the user's data, and that's the way it was built up. Um, you know, and some of the other issues similarly, I think the, the view very much, if you take something like some of the extreme extremism and, and violent content that um, was really an issue last year, I think the, the key lesson is we need to constantly raise the bar on ourselves. And that's what we've been doing. We invested meaningfully, not just in people who can do more, you know, kind of scrub of data um, and machine learning, but one of the things that was fascinating to see over the course of the year is we tried to diagnose kind of what was the underbelly in society and what was going on was that there was a lot of the, the, the conversation or the issues were actually tough for um, kind of us, normal people, to diagnose. And we needed to partner with NGOs who were experts in these areas so that they could help translate what might be a dog whistle or subtext into something that then became actionable. And so we made a, quite a substantial amount of investment in people machine learning and partnering with NGOs so that we could try and get at these issues. And another person who was on your list who's an extraordinary leader, Susan Wojcicki, who leads our YouTube business, CEO of YouTube, came out with, I thought, a really important blog post probably about a year ago where she talked about the commitment we have to our users and our community. And it's about making investments so that we raise the bar constantly on ourselves so that we can protect the users and the content creators in the community. Ruth grew up in Silicon Valley. She was actually born in London. She grew up in Silicon Valley. And um, her father, who is how old? Tell us, Ruth. It's his birthday today, 96. <laughs> and he's in great shape. And he is a physicist. He was a very renowned physicist. He and Susan Wojcicki, who had YouTube, owned by Google, number 10 on the list, right after Ruth. Um, Miss Dr. Wojcicki and Dr. Porat were actually friends. These were two family friends in Silicon Valley, and you swam in the Wojcicki's pool when you were growing up. It's kind of crazy. Life is a strange way of going full circle. So I, when I think of Ruth's career, I think of it, I, these are the two words I think of, grit and toughness. So Ruth's father is a Holocaust survivor. His entire family was killed, correct? in the Holocaust, he was, he got out. Um, Ruth has um, had, had cancer twice, two battles of cancer, 2001 and 2003. 
Uh, in 2008, when she was at Morgan Stanley, she was called by Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner to um, leave Morgan Stanley for a stretch and help basically save the financial system by uh, helping with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and uh, AIG. And Ruth, I'm curious, what has been, how has your uh, definition of success and um, a successful career changed as you as you faced a lot of tough issues. Wow. Um, well, to correct the record, I didn't actually leave Morgan Stanley. I was seconded. That's buying me thirty seconds to think of an answer to your question. You, you were know, still at Morgan Stanley, 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 but you took a leave. Yeah. So um, yeah. if I if I you kind of go yeah. through the history, my father. Um, never completed high school because he, he fled Austria during the war. And he was self-taught in physics while he was fighting in the British Army. And the message he always taught us as kids was that education is really your passport for life. So to the students who are here, I so applaud what you're doing. Uh, it is education is a passport for life and true grit is so important. And, you know, I would say, um, Cancer was not fun, but uh, it also taught me to really appreciate everything I had. And when I was first diagnosed, my children were very young. Our children were very young, four, six, and eight. And had that scary moment when you hear that word, which you know, sadly I'm, I fear a number of women here will at some point. And fortunately, medical care is a lot better than it was years ago and continues to get better. But I didn't have regrets. I looked at my career and I was really proud of what I had done. I was married to a fantastic man, still am, had three wonderful children, and so I hadn't put anything on hold. And I really worry when um, I meet people who say, well, I just need to get to this level or accomplish this. Life does not wait for you. There is no schedule, and so embrace it when you have it. So I didn't have regrets. And I'd say that the most meaningful part of my career on Wall Street really was the opportunity to work with Hank and, and Ben and Tim during those horrible days during the financial crisis, because I felt like I was using skills I had developed as a banker at a time that was so important for the country. And I feel that um, that is a privilege to be able to, to do that and focus on something that's really important and meaningful in a bigger way. Um, so. I, I guess I look at the steps along the way, and um, I don't view it as grit. I view it as sort of I'm, I've had a lot of really great privileges to work with great people in extraordinary places. And what it's the most exciting, sort of going back to my dad's lesson, is every new opportunity that came my way it was because I worked with terrific people, and I just my kind of go-to line was, what's my highest and best use? I just wanted to keep learning. And I think if you want to keep learning throughout life, you're going to keep opening great doors. So I remember being here in uh, the early October 2008, and we had David Solomon, who start, you'll see him tomorrow morning. David Solomon sitting right up front here, his first day as CEO of Goldman Sachs, is today, and he's here with us. Um, David, you weren't here, but Lloyd Blankfein was here, and Warren Buffett was here. And they were literally telling us all, those two guys were literally telling us all, it's going to be okay. This was October 2008. I just looked up today the low that the Dow hit in, May, in March of 2009. That was the low, was 6,443. Today it closed at 26,651. So, Ruth. So they um, were right. <laughs> <laughs> they were right. They were right. Um, what are the lessons from that period of, of what, you went, what you experienced, both as at Morgan Stanley and in your role with the government in 2008, 2009? Yeah, I thought a lot about the, the key lessons. And I was asked it when I first got out to Google, now Alphabet, and I actually think they're relevant for businesses in great high growth markets as well. Um, probably the most important lesson was that you need to identify your source of vulnerability and protect against it early. 
So for banking, it was liquidity. And without liquidity, the banking system, your bank choked. And it absolutely did. And you could invest to actually have very sturdy liquidity in good days. You couldn't do it in the heart of the crisis. And so when you're at that moment of pain, it's too late. And I think each one of us needs to understand our source of vulnerability and invest in those good days to protect against it. I think the other really important one, and this was really hit home to me most by the experience at AIG. The problem with AIG was the derivatives business in London. And AIG didn't have, I think, proper data analytics to understand the, the sheer risk that they were, that they had taken on. And the metaphor that I think of is that you wouldn't drive a car with mud on the windshield, um, just as you should not run a company with mud on the windshield. If you clear away that mud, you can drive much faster. And so investing in process and systems so you have the right data, data analytics, so you can make really sharp choices is another thing you need to do early. Or you will find yourself driving off a cliff because you've got mud on the windshield just like AIG did. And the third really important one, I think, is something Hank Paulson said to me during the crisis, he said, you have to have the will and the means, and too often by the time you have the will, namely the political will, you no longer have the means. And you know, he was talking about housing, and then he said the same thing talking about Greece. If we had solved Greece early, when the issue was smaller, it wouldn't have spread to the periphery. But I think that simile is true for all of us. If we waste resources in good days because it feels like why make the tough choices? You're going to rue that day uh, later. So it's, it really goes to the point of focus and, and proper capital allocation. Make sure you're picking your spots and do it early. So in 2015, when you left the CFO role at Morgan Stanley to take the CFO role at Google, which quickly became a month later, two three. months later, three months later, became the CFO role at both Google and Alphabet. Was there mud on the windshield at Google and Alphabet? And what did you, what was the toughest, what was the toughest choice that you made and, you know, made your mark on? Um, well, I think that you can always provide business leaders with great, greater data and clarity so they can make the best decisions. And that's been sort of my philosophy. It was my philosophy as CFO at Morgan Stanley and similarly here, which is if you provide the tools and resources to great business leaders, they can stack rank what's most important to be focused on in a way that's better than, than I would say I could possibly do. And one of the first things that I wanted to do, or did do, um, was take what in the tech world was excluded from the way people looked at the resources invest in their business, namely stock-based compensation, was excluded from your income statement, said, no, that is a real cost of doing business. And it probably seems really obvious to a lot of people, but historically that wasn't the way it was really done. And so it's just, again, loading up people with the data and tools so that you could then have a discussion about how are you thinking about trade-offs, what's most valuable to you. And to me, what was interesting is investors liked it because it underscored that we're really uh, acknowledging the cost of investing in the business in every way. But it also drove a lot of change internally. And I think that's, I, I always say, anchor everything in data and great decisions will follow. I think that for all of us, that's one of the things that I love data. It, gives you the fair picture, and so that's been an area I've spent a lot of time on. Um, other than that, I think that the beauty of the alphabet structure from my perspective is it was sort of the an, an inevitable sort of next iteration to be deliberate about innovation. And what I mean by that is in the earliest days at Google, Larry and Sergey were brilliant about saying, even with amazing entrepreneurs, don't take innovation for granted. And so they created, as many of you have probably read, something called 20% time. If you had a great idea, either Google let you run and pursue it, or you were probably going to go somewhere else. So let's nurture great entrepreneurial talent. And with 20% time, we had things like Gmail came about and our first VR headset. So this was a really, it was a great program. And the second iteration of this was something called X, Google X, which was our moonshot factory. It's now a separate company. We still call it X, and it's where we do the, the moonshots. So like, let's 
nurture big ideas and see where they can go, and that's where um, out of that came our self-driving car business, our first life sciences business. And so I view that as chapter two, of being deliberate about innovation. Alphabet, I view as chapter three. It was let's get everyone to focus within Google, on Google. There are a lot of really big opportunities there. And then- Which is the online services business, essentially. It's, it's, it's that whole family of things hopefully you are using many times every day, Gmail and YouTube and Maps and everything around it. Um, and so it's Google, and then we have the other bet businesses, and that's where Larry and Sergey in particular spend a lot of their time. But this notion that even at Google, they were thinking about the need to be deliberate about innovation and think about an organizational structure that would nurture that to me was really exciting. That's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna ask you to end this with just your best piece of advice to these community college students who all, I believe, all of them very much believe, being STEM students, believe in data, Ruth. Yes, well, that's good. Um, I would say the students who are up here and talked about their, their goals, I agree. Um, never stop believing anything is possible. I most certainly do. I think relative to when I started in industry, the community of uh, women and men who want to see women doing really well in business uh, continues to, to grow. It may not always feel that way, um, but it is there. And there's an extraordinary set of opportunities. Um, embrace it, pursue it, grab it, find great people with whom to work. For me, some of the best decisions I made was because somebody fantastic took a risk on me. Make sure you're working with people who take a risk on you. And um, never stop learning and having fun. Thank you, Ruth Korak. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. That was really good.